Welcome to the Winners Find a Way show and podcast with your host, Trent M. Clark, three-time World Series coach, CEO of Leadershipity, serial entrepreneur, having started 12 companies, coach to the 1%, and an international speaker. This show is going to be your go-to podcast for facing adversity, being inspired, and overcoming obstacles, all from the best in the world, business, sports, and leadership. Hate the crappy ingredients in many beverages and energy drinks? Rebellious Infusions are the go-to functional beverage. They have five or fewer plant-based organic ingredients. No sugar, no calories, loaded with antioxidants to boost your immune system. And L-thionine for brain health. Rebellious Infusions are available at drinkrebellious.com. Rethink your drink. For 10% off of your next purchase, use the code 99999. Hello and welcome to the Winners Find a Way show. I am your host, Trent Clark, serial entrepreneur, CEO of AIM, Athletic Influencer Marketing and Leadershipity, and longtime coach in professional baseball, coaching in three World Series, and excited as an international speaker, always excited to talk to people from different areas and different places of the world and different visions and views from my own. And Nick Stanger, welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, Trent. Thanks for having me. Matt, it's, it's, we're going to talk about wealth management, family office, investing today, because, man, this is a little different world. And you know, when the 1% really reach where they want to go, money becomes one of those big issues, right? And I always hear about, man, you know, most people's problems on money, they believe come from they don't have enough. Is that fair, Nick? It's possible. Yeah, I think money is probably easier to, despite you know popular opinion, money is probably easier to get and harder to keep than people realize. I think that's fair. And so I think when we talk about people, you know, many of my friends have a lot of it. And so people believe that's not a problem. And there's a lot of management that goes into when you have a lot. And in addition to, that also brings some unwarranted, sometimes unwanted attention around that as well. And so we want to talk a little bit about that today, about you know the challenges people facing in planning, making some ideas around that, getting a holistic approach to what I'm going to do, and the sustainability of, like you said, maintaining that wealth. Is that a pretty big deal? Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I think there's a a lot of ways that people get into money and sometimes it's, you know, it's an accident. Sometimes it's purposeful business sale. But a lot of what we deal with is people who uh, have just been working hard for a long time and then they wake up one day and they've got a couple million ever thought they would have. And now it introduces a new set of problems that we want to come in and help them with. Yeah, for sure. All right. So Nick Stanger, tell them first where they can find you, Nick. If they're looking for you socially, where are you best to find you, email, all that good stuff? Yeah, we do a lot on LinkedIn. And then our website is big. Go to www.stengerfamilyoffice.com. That's the name of our company, Stenger Family Office. And then email is nick, N-I-C-K dot Stenger, S-T-E-N-G-E-R at stengerfamilyoffice.com. Mouthful. Stenger.com was not available. Hey, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, but I like that. I mean, that definitely says what you're doing with the Stenger Family Office. Now, you're an independent office now, which is pretty cool. A long time Morgan Stanley office. Your dad actually founded this firm back in 81 and, and you're, you're maintaining it. And it's one of the things I love about you, Nick, is that Nick is a seventh generation stanger here in, well, not here, but where you're at, I guess, neighbor, Illinois, Neighborville. And Neighborville is a really fabulous suburban, West suburban of Chicago and lovely area. And now, and you're about to have the eighth generation of the Stangers here within five days. Is that right? Yep, that's right. Coming up soon. And the big joke was that my wife was, you know, nine months pregnant with a baby and we were basically nine months pregnant with a new business. So (laughs) kind of on the same track and It's a little hectic to have a baby and start a business at the same time. But like we were talking about before, Trent, it's about 12 months, maybe even longer to plan things and think through your due diligence on starting a business. And then it's only nine to have a baby. So right off the bat, you've got a little mismatch on your time frame. Yeah. And talk about the new business. I mean, it's an obviously challenge, a major challenge to be with, you know, big firm like Morgan Stanley for years and then switch over into this private independent space. And obviously Charles Schwab underwriting you guys, which is really cool. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, you've been in the investment game. You're a Chicago kid. You go and do your schooling down at the lovely Jesuit school there. 
of Loyola. And listen, man, I mean, Loyola is very strategic. I mean, it's it's right downtown. I mean, this is like a city university, very, what I would consider very similar to like a Columbia. And talk to me about that experience. Well, Chicago is just a, a great city and obviously has some problems like any city, but Chicago has really aggregated I think the best of all the schools, you've got Northwestern down there, you've got Loyola, you've got U Chicago and a host of other schools that it's just this boom in education. And so I went to school at the Water Tower campus, which is right downtown. You cannot get any closer to the Chicago when you're on, on right, you know, right there on Pearson Street. And, and that's where all my apartments were downtown. And they've done a nice job with the school of having just a phenomenal finance program. They have a brand new building down there. And it's a couple years old now, but they have built a nice investment club. And, and I was part of that, of course, and some of the other things that they do. And uh, they just have a thriving accounting program. They've got a thriving law school down there. And what it's done is it's just made Loyola, I think, for people who are looking for a city experience. And I kind of ended up at Loyola, not totally on, I transferred in my sophomore year and was looking to do more an accounting finance type of thing, which is what I ended up doing. And you have all these companies that are right downtown and, and you've got, like I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers, but you've got all these major corporations right at your fingertips that are recruiting. And the school does a nice job with their alumni relations and building relationships with companies. So they have job fairs all, all the time, at least I think you know a couple of times a semester where you're interacting with these top businesses. And I, I think that's really important. You know, and if you go to some other school that have that, I think it makes it a little bit tougher to get these internships and all those internships. We run a very robust internship program with our company now. And we've always done this where we hire local is so important because that can leapfrog you and sometimes be even more educational than some of your classes when you're in school. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I think you know, when, I think it's one of the biggest things is I've run a lot of internship programs and I'm looking for experience over schooling. Everybody can go get the schooling, you know, like, but it's hard to go get those good experiences. So man, a big shout out to Loyola, by the way. And you didn't even mention the basketball team, which is impressive. And then, which is good, by the way, right? And, but man, it's, and I, I love like what you learned just as, as relatively an intentional observer going through that yourself, how to run a good internship program for yourself, because the best companies in the world are doing it. And you're seeing how they're doing it right on your campus. Like they're bringing it right under your nose. And so instead of just being a, a number or part of that mix as a participant, really grabbing that and learning from that and seeing what others did well and did right and the experiences that you've had, and then now attaching this to your brand, to your company, and having that same kind of offering. That's a big deal. And I think that sometimes people don't recognize how much modeling is actually, actually happening from these brands and their responsibility in that, both good and bad. Because, you know, we've also seen pretty bad programs and people are like coming back to Google going, oh my gosh, this was a horrible experience. Don't ever do this, right? And it's like, man, the whole thing you were going for just backfired. Yeah, there's. I, I think internships actually play a massive role in our economy in general because what's happened at colleges, I think, and it's not all of them, but there's certainly a lot where people really have no idea what they're doing. You know, they come in at 18 years old, like I did, and you have really plan. And that's understandable. You're 18. But I think the internship really should start sooner. I think people should have some apprenticeship programs. They should learn from people. And I think this can really steer people in the right direction rather than not really knowing what they want to do. And and you've seen this trend too, all over the place, all the reports coming out that people are the least happy in their job. And I think some survey from CNBC that says that people are uh, the uh, highest point of wanting to find something else and not totally satisfied. And I think the internship experience can help change that because you've got a lot of people who just don't really love what they do. And if you don't love what you and you're doing it for 40 years, that's a little bit tough. Yeah, I think there's also a great bridge in that internship program. You know, two things that I've seen that have been very effective in interning programs is one, well, I'm going to say three. One is it's a great opportunity for mentoring. You know, it's a great opportunity for someone to come alongside a young person and develop their habits. Two, it's a great transition from any other youth job you've had, from lifeguard to you know, working at the cash register, at the five and dimer, you know, like this is now, and I see this as a real challenge. I see people coming into the workforce at 25 and 26, teaching their career job, you know, really treating their, their career job as like 
my high school hourly job. Like, no, no, no. You're going to be here a long time and your reputation is going to matter and how you carry yourself and all those things you do. And like, man, you can't just be like, hey, I got fired from Arby. So I'm going to go work at Burger King. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. That's not how the career thing works, man. Like it's going to go very badly. The third thing is that Man, I have had some of the best discussions that, by the way, have challenged my theories, my structure, my systems by these young, hungry college students who are either doing their undergrad or master's program, and they're constantly in learning mode. They want to learn why we do it the way we do it. And I have to answer to that, right, as their lead in some of these programs. So you you have to have very sound principles. And I'll tell you, Dick, some of the best ideas in my organization came from interns. Amazing. Oh, totally. Well, and well, the rate of technological change is just un- unbelievable. And so if you aren't talking with younger people, if you aren't constantly on the forefront yourself, you better be having somebody who is and somebody who knows, you know, a lot of these technologies. I used to think I was pretty good with technology. I think I'm okay. And then you see some of these people coming up in high school and college and, and you see what they're doing. You're going, I'm behind now, you know, and so you have to, you have to surround yourself with people who are going to keep you relevant because the, the tech world is moving so quickly. It's never moved this fast and it'll never move this slow again. That's a quote from Brian Westbury, who we follow a lot, but I think that's the reality is you have to be around people that know what the next thing is going to be. And you see these companies over time and we invest in these companies where if they're be behind the new tech, it can wipe out a you know, hundred, two hundred billion dollar business can evaporate in a matter of months. I mean, and, you know, in my show last week, really talking a lot with Marty Strong, who's uh, an author, does a lot. And he has a new book coming out called Be Different. And it's really about innovate. And, man, you know, like innovation keeps you relevant, right? Like, I mean, you've got to innovate to kind of stay on this. And so if you don't have some people that understand that technology, and I think it's one of the things that's really attractive right now in the baby boomer uh, sales space. Because there's a ton of baby boomers that have great businesses out there. I mean, they're incredible. And they have the lack of innovation is highly evident. And so, but innovation is very scalable. So, you know, you got the idea. If you can take some of these baby boomer businesses that have been very steady, eddy, three, four million dollar companies and move these things through innovation and technology, 12, 15 million dollars. With relatively, like you said, we talked a little bit off this off air, and maybe you could speak to this, is the point of entry for some of these small businesses now is much different than it was even four years ago because of the software access, the the cost of things. I mean, technology just continues to become less expensive and more available. So I don't need to be a $100 million firm to create a marketing program and create and get new clients. And so walk me through a little bit about how you viewed that at Stanger, because I think it's unique. Well, innovation what drives the economy, right? And and the miracle of the United States, it's so unique. It's It truly is a miracle. If you don't see that, you need to look more closely at the data. Like the, the United States is born out of entrepreneurship, right? It was born out of innovation. It was a bunch of people who said, we can do things better. And they did. And look at where we're at today. Not a single place on earth that invents like we do, that attracts the talent we do. And for all the people, I mean, it's not that these other people in other countries aren't smart, but it's the fact that they've come here with their great ideas to chase the American dream, which I believe is just totally alive. I think it's booming. And you get a lot of doom and gloom out there that says that it's dead. I disagree. I think that the that this country has just absolutely we've set ourselves up so well for entrepreneurs to thrive. And it's the difference between us and China. You know, you you come up with a new idea in China, you're entrepreneurial and you're innovative and sure enough a couple, you know, a couple years in, you may find yourself in a, in a prison, right? You may find yourself getting your company taken away from. And yeah, we've got problems in the US. There's no question about it, but we do have the rule of law. We do have personal property rights, which is allowed people to thrive. And, and so innovation is off the charts. That's what we uh, did with our company. And, and we said, you know, in our old model and, and you know, they've, they've done a nice job where they're at. But I think with any 
company sure and growing and been around for you know a long long time what can happen is can stagnate and it's all over the place you see these and we kind of call them zombie companies you know and they, they make a lot of cash flow they make a lot of profit however there's not as much innovation and you see this on all 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 sectors all economies where i think bureaucracy gets to the point where it just it, it kind of crushes real spirit and that's what you've seen and the larger and larger even government gets and the larger and larger that some corporations get with their policies and procedures and red tape you need a lot of that stuff that's important to thrive but if it goes too far it crushes innovation and that's what we've done here we've empowered our people and we've said hey if you've got an idea we want to hear it right we want to implement we've given people decision making authority we've given people the power to look at them and, and come up with a solution and obviously there's different decision making points right some decisions carry uh, bigger consequences than others so we still want to have some processes around that but on little decisions and little things that will make life better of course we want to give people the the authority to do that that's how you grow over time it's not central planning it's not a you know two or three people in a room coming up with all the ideas it's everyone and i think that's the that's the key yeah i think that's really well said nick i mean you touched on a lot of great stuff there right now and i do feel like i think it's a concern for a lot of entrepreneurs how it feels like government's getting bigger and big companies are almost meshing with government you know you, we see this overreach all over the place and it's like oh wait a minute we well we didn't really know about that but we knew about that <laughs> like it's kind of like wait a minute man and that feels like a very different environment and commiserate with other countries that don't carry that entrepreneurial spirit right and i i had uh a young lady named Alexandra Efimova. She's a great entrepreneur from Russia. And I remember her talking in the interview about, you know, she was, when she moved here at 16 years old, she'd never heard the word entrepreneur, like didn't know what that word wow. meant. I mean, like, because there aren't any in Russia for her as a child. Like she never met anyone who owned the flower shop, who owned their own hair studio, who like the government owned everything, right? And they decide. And so it's like, man, like, so I think it's a great reminder, Nick, this is a great country. It is a great reminder that, listen, everyone's coming to be here. <laughs> like, you know, we don't, we don't have people going the other way, right? And they're bringing their best ideas. And man, I think there's that mindset from the early, you know, forefathers and adopters of, people that really took a risk to come was like, Hey, we have to be solutions minded. Like there's no catch net on this thing. Like we're going out and we're going to walk the the high wire here. And like, we got to get this right. Like this is going to be really risky. And, you know, I like to remind people, you know, Hey, like if, if you were going to have like, you know, you take the former twin towers or buildings that tall and apart and you hang a wire. And I said, Hey, Nick, I'll give you a million dollars. If you walk the wire between the building and you're looking at like, you know, I could make a million dollars a lot of different ways. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know if I need to do this and risk this whole thing, man. I'm trying to salvage my eighth generation right now. Like, I don't know if I need this. Now, if under the 110th floor on the 109th, I put a net all the way across underneath you. I mean, you want to give it a shot for a million bucks? You're like, hey, yeah, sure, man. I'm going to take a shot at it. Like risk reward, right? And so, man, it, I think those early adopters, man, they were walking that line without a net, man. And now there's really a lot of nets in place that we can really, if you're doing it right, you know, this is part of what you do. Part of what you do is that before crazy guys like me take a bunch of risks on a business, you shore up and say, hey, listen, I know I'm going to be fiscally okay. Because here's my worst case scenario. The business doesn't work. It goes under and it's not working. But, you know, my man, Nick's invested my money. I've got this set aside. Like I, I have a budget for this and when it's over, it's over. But you know, this isn't taking everything I own and I'm going to go millions of dollars in debt. To let's see if it works. And then be a BK at, you know, 55 years old going, oh, I should start again. <laughs> That's probably, I mean, talk to me about some of those both both winning scenarios you've seen and big losing scenarios you've seen. Well, one of the things that people don't realize about entrepreneurship is they look at billionaires, they look at entrepreneurs and they they only look at the ones who have been successful, you know, and they they see all the success which is less likely than failure. You know, failure is much more probable than success. And so what we don't ever talk about is all the entrepreneurs and and people that have gone before us that haven't made it. And so I think what good entrepreneurs do is, yeah, they they're dreamers. Yeah, you know, they they want to look think big, right? But there's a whole lot of risk management that goes on behind the scenes that people don't think about. 
you know, and there, yeah. there's scenario analysis and there's probabilities and there's, there's so much risk analysis. And that's what we do for our clients, you know, because all it takes is you step on a giant rake and it's all over and, and just look at SVB, not fantastic yeah. risk management procedures and controls. One of the other ones that's struggling first Republic right now, first Republic bank, and, and who knows what'll happen there. I, I think it's too early to make a call, but I think the problem is, is people will engage in just the, Hey, what's the, best case scenario rather than, hey, what's the worst case scenario? And so we we try to help our clients do that. We try to say, okay, here's the upside, of course, but then here's the downside and here's some of your risks. And, and so we operate in this world of blind spots. Everybody knows the movie, The Blinds, I think it was The Blind Side, right? And so that's where we operate. That's where we earn our money is not to necessarily knock it out of, par- out of the park and bat a thousand every single time or what we're, the advice we're giving. But our goal is to make sure that people don't get completely blown out of the water. And so if you can keep yourself in the middle from a risk perspective and yeah, maybe you just the market each and every year, but at the same time, you go through a year like 2020, you go through the tech crisis in 2000, 2001 or 08 and 09, like everybody remembers or the savings and loans and all these different things that have happened. If you can just stay in the middle of the road and not get completely blown up, that's really why you hire somebody like us or, or another good financial advisor. You want to hire somebody to help you with the risk management. What's the downside of the, the choices and the investments and the decisions you're making? Yeah, that's really big, man. I, I think that it's a very interesting, and I'm glad you highlighted it. Most people don't think, like they see people be successful. And some of the most successful entrepreneurs that you know are really good at risk management because they've really calculated that. They have teams of advisors like yourselves, like your team and other people that are surrounding them, making them aware of like, hey, where this is going to be. And so, you know, I think that's what we've done a lot in our consulting practice is we practice to get to where we want to go and recognize that, hey, while that journey is happening, you know, it's not easy and you need to be aware of some of the things that are going to a pitfall. I mean, it was it was probably the biggest thing was with professional sports is like prepping for something that's about to happen. And they don't really know how it is until you actually get in and do it. Right. And so that's not easy because you're trying to see all the blind spots and where the risks are. And man, that is tough, man. You know, it's incredible. And, you know, I think this is one of those things that most people don't know on the risk, like literally half of all businesses don't make it to five years. Right. And only like 30% make it to 15 years. So this is a tough game. This isn't for the faint at heart. Like this is half are going to fail within five years. That's a big number. And so there's a risk in that. And there's a monetary cost to that, that a lot of people, while they recognize it's real, man, like you say, it could have generational damage on the families when done improperly. Well, Trent, you're touching on a really important, and, and it's the fact that in businesses, well, you talk about family wealth. Most family wealth usually doesn't make it past the third generation. You're, you're very, if you can get it to the second, if you get it to the third, you're an all-star. It is very tough. Like our family, seven generations, my son will be eight generations. It's very, very tough to keep things going for that long, unless you have a group of people around you. Right. And, and I'm a big believer in, in, the book of Proverbs in the Bible, it says you surround yourself with a wise group of counselors. You don't put yourself on an island alone. You want to surround yourself with people that are experts, right? That's what we've done. And so the coolest thing, you mentioned my father who started our business in 1981. He was a journaler his entire career. And I think that's so important. And, and he literally went back and wrote all these different stories. When things would happen, he would write them down and he would watch families over 40 years. You get to see a lot of stuff in a time frame like that. And we have a collection of those stories now. We have a collection of, hey, 1,200 people we've worked with for 42 years now. What really has worked? What hasn't worked? And we know the stories and, and we teach them to our team. We say, hey, if you don't do this, here's what can happen. And why do we know that? Because it actually did happen to one of our families. Yeah. You see, and, yeah. and everybody has the proverbial, you get hit by a bus example. We literally have a story like that where both mom and dad went down in the same plane. You see, yeah. and, and so anything you can possibly imagine, we've been there, we've seen it happen to somebody. And so we know, hey, here's the proper guardrails that we have to put alongside a family that we've got. And, and it's, 
that you lose big wipeouts. And, and I think that's the neatest thing. It's like doctors, you know, and, and, and not every doctor is created equal. I, I think, you know, and everybody knows that, right? And when you describe your doctor, how do you describe him to your friend? You say, it's the best. My, my doctor's the best doctor, the best lawyer, the best dentist, or whoever you're talking about. Financial planners and wealth managers are no different. And a lot of the reason why people describe their the professional as the best, I think simply comes down to intellectual capital. It's, hey, what has this guy seen and been through? He's fought in the trenches, right? He knows what's out there. He knows what can happen. That's what makes them the best. It's intellectual capital that separates them from all the rest. And you talk about winners find a way. Well, that's a lot of what it is. It's it's just pure battle experience. And and so you have to know the stories. You have to have seen things happen to people so that you know how to prevent it from happening to other people. And, you know, we've got a family where years ago, mom and dad, a couple million dollars in assets, left the money to three kids without an estate plan. And we kept pushing, 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 get an estate plan, get it done. It's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars to set it up. But once you get it done, it's done. You can rest easy. We're about to sign the documents, passed away, unfortunately. Kids spent the money in two years, 40 years uh-huh. of work gone in two. And so that's what we try to do is we, you know, and, and with Stenger family office, we kept seeing this before in our old structure where, yeah, we could manage the money effectively. We could do the financial plan effectively, but then we'd send them to their local CPA or we'd send them to their estate planner and all that's fine. If you've got good people, we want to keep you with your people that you've got. But if you don't, we got to get you to somebody good so that then we're, when there's a trigger event that happens and when, and, you know, when you get kind of bounced off your plan, you know where to go back. And, yeah. and you're, we know that with confidence, you're going to be able to get good advice from your attorney. You're going to get good advice from your CPA that we're all going to be on the same page. We've got the CPA on our payroll now as Stenger Family Office. We've got the attorney in our office. And that just makes a huge difference over time because then people can really navigate and, and stay on a plan. I, I That is so key. And you look at these families who have done it, like Walmart family, the Rockefellers, these big U.S. families that have lasted for generation after generation. They've been doing this for 200 years. Yeah. I mean, that's the interesting thing. And we're seeing it a little bit in Grand Rapids as the Van Andels and DeVos family and from Amway. And by the way, how a community thrives behind the family that have really created a plan to give back and give back into their community, which has just been amazing. And I, I think people sometimes don't appreciate all the things like in Chicago and uh, Grand Rapids. I find it very heavily in the Midwest that how much is available to just members of the community because they live there based on four or five families that have just donated a ton of arts and you know facilities to the general public for continuing education whether that be in whatever it is. And it's really kind of shaped a lot of America when you really think about some of the big things and and some of these families. And so it's, and they're prominent families, right? As you said, they're families that have lasted that 200 year generation. That's a lot of folks that have not only been involved, but given back a portion of that into it. And I think it's probably one of the things, you know, that we could probably be doing better, I think, in this country of, giving more. I mean, we have a lot. And I know people don't think they have a lot because they're comparing themselves to the Rockefeller, <laughs> right? And you're like, hey man, that's probably a bad comparison, right? And so, but there's a, we have a lot of benefit in this country. And the other thing you touched on, which is really great was the book of Proverbs, right? I mean, about wisdom. I mean, I really encourage anyone out there, even if you've never read a, a Bible, the book of Proverbs is 30 books. So, mm-hmm. I highly recommend it's a fabulous place to start where you read a book a day in a month and it's 30 days and like, and and take some notes about what you learn and how you might apply that in your life. Because there is just an insurmountable of, of wisdom in that short time of one month that'll just gain tons of clarity and traction for your life, your business, your relationships. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I uh, often will wake up to a text from my dad saying, hey, did you read your daily proverb today? Did you read the 27th, you know, like today? And and it is, you know, and in and, and the book of Proverbs, it per- personifies wisdom. That's the, the neat thing about Proverbs is it's it's almost personified. I totally agree. And I, I actually, I, I tend to believe that the Bible is really the source of all wisdom. The source of all knowledge comes from it. And so anything that we say or do, really, you could trace back to the Bible, any source of truth 
uh, can be found there. And, and, and you cannot, I don't think effectively as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, I don't think you can do it without that. I, I think long run, you have to go back to that and have some sort of ballast in your life. Yeah, I, I was criticized a little bit. I'll use that word criticized. It was a nice, friendly gesture from someone in the in the media and public that you know, one of the things I'd said was old fashioned. It was pretty old fashioned. And I said, my reply was, yeah, it's really old fashioned. I call it foundational. It's about 2000 year old wisdom is what it is. <laughs> like, you know, like, and I said, you know, listen, when we talk about families and parenting and the foundation of humanity, big itty words, humanity, man, like th- that foundation solid, man. Like you can build that on rock and know that it's good. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the modern day, we're trying to redress that up. And by the way, that's very successful. You know, I'm in the leadership business, obviously, <laughs> right, Nick? And so, yep. you know, I see a lot of great leadership books and people go, oh my gosh, this is just fabulous writing. And I'm like, I know, you know, a lot of it, you can just find right in the book of James, <laughs> like, you know, right here, like, right. Yep. And it's like, this is perfect. This, uh, this author is unbelievable. And I'm like, yeah, the principles are 2000 years old. So, you know, just, just to kind of clarify, you know, this is not new information, stated very well, stated in a modern way, which is really important for translation. So yeah, I found that intriguing. You know, for, for the audience, Nick, you know, a lot of people, you know, the show's premise is, is winners when shown data that they are losing, find a way to win, you know, and someone who wakes up my age, 55 years old, well, I'm a little less than that, but like 55 years old, they wake up and they realize I haven't saved enough. I, I, I have not followed a good plan. And The data shows I may be losing here (laughs) because I'm going to get to this retirement age and I will not have enough given the escalators of costs, given the escalators of our economy. And they're concerned with that. How do they find a way to win? Well, I was a tennis coach and instructor starting my freshman year of high school. I I actually went around and my dad's like, hey, you got to do something over the summer. Like you need to get out of the house and get a job. So I went down to the local Ace Hardware and they're like, you know, telling me what I was going to do. And I'm like, yeah, I I don't want to do this for, you know, 850 an hour or whatever. So I was a tennis player and I said, oh, maybe, maybe I could teach some tennis lessons. So I walked around church with some flyers and that's how I got my first student. And then after that, it grew substantially. I had like 400 students at the end of it, at the end of the eight years I ran it. But I was a tennis coach and, and, you know, with left to their own devices, your students are not going to get better. You know, they're just not, you know, and, and mom and mom will drop them off. And sometimes it's glorified babysitting. But for some of the students we had, they were genuinely wanting to get better. But even the back off once in a while, maybe you don't show up to practice on time. And so that's why you, you have a coach. You have somebody there who's going to coach you on what you're supposed to do on your plan, similar to what you do, Trent, in your business. But I think that's so critical, whether you're coaching an entrepreneur or whether you're coaching a, a client, a family on, on their financial plan, you've got to have accountability. You've got to have somebody who's going to hold your feet to the fire and say, hey, how are we doing against our objectives? Not somebody who checks in every three years just to sell you a new product, but somebody who's going to come in and they're going to be incentivized to keep you on a long-term plan. You have to have that. I, I don't think you can discount the coaching, the value of the advice you're getting and somebody who's going to say, Hey, you know, we said we were going to do this and you know, we're not doing it. Right. And so again, I think it just goes back to who are the people you're surrounding yourself with? Are you surrounding yourself with other winners? So winners find a way. Yeah. They find a way if they've surrounded themselves with other people who are winning, how many times you, you know, growing up, you you hear, you know, you know, from your parents, you know, it's like, you're going to be an average of the five people you spend time with, you know? And so you want to be successful long term and it's not that you you friend shopping or anything like that or social climbing that that's not it at all but i think one day when you wake up you're going to realize that you sort of are a average of your five friends. You know, you're going to be an average of the people you spend your time with. And so what we do with our business is we do a lot of different events and, and we'll have an event like we just had like where we'll have a, our top clients out for a dinner. And yeah, there's a presentation and there's some obviously eating steak and having a good time and all that, but people love them. They'll walk away saying, Hey, I got to sit next to your other client and, and he's doing this and that. And, and it's almost like networking. It, it's kind of like grief share. You know, we're all going through a marked client going through this and uh, it's not just us and, and, you know, all the Nick's clients, all the Stinger family office clients, we're all here together. And that is so cool to be able to talk to people after an event and say, yeah, I got to sit next to the gym and, and we're actually, you know, and I had a client one time told me, you know, we got their number and we're going to go out to dinner next. 
next week. And I go, that's great. That's exactly what we want. So how do you win? Well, you just, you have to, it's like osmosis. You have to be in the right places. You have to fish in the right ponds. That is, that's, I think probably the most important thing. That's good advice. I mean, I think that you know, a lot of people probably aren't in a position to surround, or they're not choosing to position themselves, surrounding themselves with the right folks. And some may not know who those folks are, right? Like, who do who should I be looking for? But I'm telling you, you can find all that information for less than a dollar in fines now at the public library. Like, this is not hard, but you do have to do the research. And man, the tools available now, like the library, LinkedIn, I mean, the internet, Google, I mean, it's now you got chat GPT. I mean, it'll write up a letter of, Hey, Nick, could you mentor me and help me through this and help me understand how I could do it? Could you show me a way, introduce me to someone who could help me? I mean, I think when you're losing, sometimes it's hard to ask for help. And I think the willingness and commitment it takes to actually do the things that you're going to ask someone of is another step. That's significant. And that's part of that accountability. That's part of that tough love. It's like, I'm going to hold you over this, that we said, hey, this is what we're going to do. And we're all going to do what we said we were going to do. And man, I feel like, Nick, in recent years, you know, accountability has kind of been a four letter word, right? Like people don't like it. And I get it. Like, I get the fact that when I haven't done my part and Nick calls me and says, hey, listen, man, you know, you had a $2,000 set aside for this fund this month and last month. And I see either deposits present right now. So what's up? Like, ah, well, you know, one of the cars went down and I had to do this and I had to do that. And, you know, I forgot about my mom's, you know, 80th birthday party and that needed some funds. And, you know, and so excuses, all sorts of answers of why it didn't happen. But so it's uncomfortable to have those conversations that I didn't get done what I said I, I would get done. But you're not doing it to make me feel bad about myself. You're not doing it to hurt my feelings. You're doing it because there's a plan in place and there's a goal set. And in order to reach that goal, a plan has to be executed. We do have to follow through on this. It's not just hope is not a strategy, right? So talk to me about some of those conversations you've had to have with folks and realize that this is not ill intended. This is not ill will. Those conversations that we've had, and we have them from time to time, I'd say 90% of our clients do stick to their plan. They do just fine. And then they take the advice and they're paying us. And that's why they're paying us, by the way, because they know they can't do it on their own, right? There's a certain level of, of wanting to admit that, hey, I need help. That's my personality too. I think, you know, you're in life, you're probably either a delegator or a DIY. And I'm a delegator. I, I like to give it to the experts and say, hey, you tell me what's best and I'm going to trust that you're going to give me good unbiased advice. And so that's where we operate. We want to work with people like that who, who you know, they, they want to have us give them good advice over time. For the 10% of people that don't, they, they sort of over time weed themselves out. But those conversations can go one of two ways. One way is they do improve. And I have seen people improve and, and we have a serious talk and we use data and math and we just try to make it unemotional, even though there are a lot of emotions tied into these decisions. You got to go back to the math statistics and analysis. You have to show people, hey, if you don't do this, this is where you're going to end up. You have to show yeah. them the outcome. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, then the conversation can go the other way. And, you know, sometimes people do part ways and they have to go a, a way that they feel is best because, you know, at the end of it, if somebody's not going to take our advice, if they're not going to stay on the plan, then it's going to be a very tough relationship because their expectation is not going to be met. And when you do that, my, my dad has always said, and I think this is a strategic coach thing, is the definition of a mess is an obligation without a commitment. Mm. So if you don't have that commitment to stick to the plan, if, if you aren't following what we're telling you to do, then uh, both of us are going to end up in a spot where we're, we're not totally satisfied. So I think those people kind of weed themselves out over time. I'm sure you've seen that on your business where if people don't believe in the advice you're giving, then it's best to sometimes part ways. And for all the people who do stick to it, the 90% that do over time, they're, they're your best advocates because they'll tell people like our clients, you know, I've been retired for 25 years. I've been taking money out every year. You know, they have stuck to the plan because we know the plan works. Yeah. We lost your audio there for a second, but yeah, 25 years. And committed, followed through, stayed with the plan. That was the goal. That was the execution. And, you know, slow and steady wins the race, right? Like, I mean, this is tortoise and hare again, right? And, man, I, 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 I'm reminded, and I love the idea of 
you know, getting a visual of goal that you set out, what you were putting out there. I'm, you know, I reminded of the movie Day and Night, you know, where Tom Cruise is like, with me, without me, with me, without me, you know, like, here's your goals. Like, hey, listen, your chances of survival without me are very low. And with me, they're very high, right? Like, and so, you know, I think there's this idea of like, hey, we can continue on this path. But if this is a poor path, this is where you'll end up. You told me this is where you want to end up. And so we've advised as a trusted advisor, we've advised this path of these things. And we agreed this is what we do. So if we're not going to do that, then we are likely to get closer to this thing down here that you don't want. But I want to advise clearly that this is the path we're on. So when we arrive there, no one's surprised, right? Like, hey, I thought we were going to Disney World. And it turns out, this is the trash yard and I got to throw out my trash. And this is, you know, the dumping ground. <laughs> like, you know, like, wait a minute, this isn't fun. This isn't what I was hoping for. Like, right. Oh no, I know. I get that. So I think really good advice, Nick. Try to remind our team is if you want clients over time, you want them to be, you want them not to be surprised. Well, now with today's technology that we have access to, it's just incredible. We can do this for people that have one to 10 or, or you know, maybe 15, but it's, it's lowered the entry bar for a lot of families who desperately need a lot of this tech, a lot of this data at their fingertips so that they can stay on a plan. And your job becomes so much easier when you have this technology, when you have it accessible and you can see we, we have something to like a risk score and it shows you where do you fall and, and how where is where's the risk in your portfolio we have financial planning software that gives you a monte carlo simulation it'll tell you out of a hundred percent where do you you know how successful is your plan going to be and and all that simply means is are you going to run out of money during your lifetime and so we're able to take all this technology and, and it makes the conversations just a lot more direct and, and we can say here's what your plan says you know, and, and yeah. so that's the exciting part for us is to be able to bring all that tech together alongside the personal relationship and marry those two things together. Yeah, it comes back to that, Nick, trust God, all else bring data, right? Like, you know, because that's the thing we really want. We want someone to say, hey, here's the data and this is what it's telling us. And I'd love to tell you, you're fine and you're okay, but the data doesn't say that. And this is why it doesn't say that. But let's not dwell on it that you're not going to be fine. You're fine today. Let's adjust the plan accordingly. So the data says, hey, you're on your way and you're going to get there. And I think people just got to be open to that. I think that's that's probably part of that risk management. That's part of that humility as a leader. It's also part of that, you know, prioritization and perspective, right? I, I think there's a lot of people, listen, $5 million is a lot of money in a family to invest, which we, we know the eighth grade wonder of co is compound interest, right? So as we look at the rule of 72, for an example, and you're like, okay, hey, listen, you've had this third generation at $5 million. I'm like, well, why do we need a guy like Nick Stanger and the Stanger family group? We don't have our own plane. We don't have that kind of money. But here we go on a 7.2% return, 10 years, your money's going to double, right? And so you've got this 10 years and all of a sudden it's 10. And then 10 more years, it's 20. And then 10 more years, it's 40, right? And you're like going, wait a minute, man. Like, hold on. Like all at 7.2%. Like that doesn't sound like, hey, man, these, I hear tech companies get like 60% returns. Like, listen, man, slow and steady. This isn't like rocket science, right? This thing is going to work and it's going to work for you. But you got to allow it to work and you got to put it in the right place. Tell me how you walk people through that challenge. Trent. You're exactly right. The average mutual fund or the average index is supposed to get, let's just say seven or eight or 9%, whichever risk tolerance you've got. If you look at the research, I think it was either Vanguard or Fidelity who put this out. Yeah, the index gets 9%. The average investor does not get 9%. The average investor gets like maybe half of that. So what's the what makes up for the big gap? Well, the big gap is behavior. And yeah, it all sounds fine and well. We've got a plan. It, everything sounds great. Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face or the mouth. And that's exactly what we do is, yeah, everything is great and everything's fine and the market's going to be up and, and you know, rising tide lifts all boats. You saw that during COVID. 0% interest rates make a lot of people look like geniuses. Mm. And then now interest rates are 5% and they're going higher. And I tend to think they're going to 6% before they go down. And, yeah. and that completely changes the asset allocation game. That completely changes the financial planning world. It, it, because if you can get 6% or 5% with relatively low risk, you better be getting a lot more on a stock to take that same risk on. 
I think what's going to happen, like Warren Buffett always says, is, yeah, rising tide lifts all boats. It's not until the tide goes out that you find out who's swimming naked, right? And so when the interest rates go up and liquidity is pulled out of the system, all those same people who are getting those crazy returns during 2020, 2021, even sometimes a little bit in 2022, are going to look a lot different here. And so our job is not to again, blow it out of the park every year. Our job is to keep you in the middle. We're, our, our job is to not get completely wiped out, you see. And so like last year through the process, even in 2020, we were okay. Yeah, we're down, you know, we're down just like everybody else, but we didn't get blown out of the water. And, and so that's the key. You're also going to have trigger events. Something's going to happen inevitably. As much as we want to think everything's going to be fine and stay the same, things happen. There's health problems that come up. I, actually, uh, it was last year I had my appendix removed, emergency appendectomy surgery. It turned into sepsis and uh, I almost died. I, I, I yeah. mean, I was like, like literally 48 hours away, the doctor said, from not making it. So this is not something that you plan for. You don't wake up one day thinking, I'm going to end up in the hospital with, with emergency appendectomy. You better have a plan for it, right? You better have a backup to your backup plan. And that's where we come in and we say, hey, there's going to be all these trigger events that happen. There will be people that will pass away. There could be windfalls. There could be diseases, illness, all these different you know, kind of one-off scenarios that can happen. And our job is then to stand in the gap for the family. Our job is to be there to say, hey, you can count on us. That's what you're paying. You know, and so it's, you know, a lot of couples that hire us, like, like the husband and wife, a lot of times the husband isn't hiring us, beat the market every single year. He's hiring us because he knows that if something ever happens to him, that we'll do the right thing for his, his wife, that we're going to be there for the family. And we have done this so many times and we have stood in the gap and we have been the voices in, and everybody's got, you know, an Uncle Joe from out of town that's got some great ideas on what to do. And then there's the stuff on TV and you, you see all these crazy advertisements on, oh, this is the best place to beat inflation, for example, or here's what you should do. And, and our job is just to say, OK, that all sounds good, but let's just back up for two seconds and let's just, you know, go back to the plan that we put together and that we've been working and executing on for the past 10, 15, 20 years and hold people's hand through that so that they don't get thrown off when when the, the waves get a little bit choppy. Yeah. Oh, that's good advice. Like, hey, Nick Stanger from the Stanger Family Office Group. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining us on the Winners on Away show, talking money, talking about investments. I love this quote, you know, as far as a mess, an obligation without a commitment, man. I mean, the definition of a mess. I think that, you know, we see that. We don't always get comfortable and love talking about financials and where we're at and what we're planning. So love it. Nick, for you, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk to you about, you know, you're what most people don't know about you, which is you're a talented musician and can play about, you know, 70 different instruments, right? So, but for you, for people that are out there, you know, challenged today, what would you give one piece of advice that maybe we haven't covered yet today that you think like, hey, get back to that foundational aspect? What would you recommend? I think you have to just take some time to reorient, you know, and we all go through this, you know, entrepreneurs, it's a lot of pressure even to be the leader of your own family. And so you have to just fill yourself back up. I think it was either Simon Sinek or some one of the guys like Pat Lentz or somebody, one of these really good guys who talks about leadership, who says, you have to be filled up yourself before you can possibly have an outflow for others. And so you need to constantly be refreshed. And, and I struggle with that. I, I'd say that's actually one of my biggest weaknesses is I need to be able to go back and just kind of refresh and, and take some time away and, and just relax. If you're just leading your family or you're a leader at your office or you're leading a company, whatever you're doing, wherever God has you in your life, you need to be constantly going back to that source of refreshment so that you can have some outflow and some outpouring for others. Otherwise, if you're just drained constantly, if you're constantly tired and, and not well rested and you're not getting good um, advice yourself and, and you're not going back to, to the basics, I think you can really, you know, you, know, you can get kind of blown out of the water. And then when something big does happen, it can really set you off. So I think you have to just constantly be going back and, and making sure that you're taking care of yourself so that you can you can be there for others. Yeah, good advice. I think it's it's a challenge. For leaders to, to do it like it feels a little selfish right i think an inventory in a challenging time is really important i fly a lot and they say in case of emergency put your mask on first then you can help others right like make sure you have oxygen flowing because if you don't have oxygen you're not gonna be a lot of help to us all right so like hey it's basic right like put on your oxygen mask first and even, i always even, think about that even jesus went off on his own to pray yeah 
need some time to do some inventory, man. Like take some time, reset, get where I want to be. Talk to my father, right? And level this thing out, man. These are challenges. It wasn't easy. There's no easy walk down here, man. That's for sure. So for everybody, thank you for joining us on the Winter Side Away Show. Thank you to my guest, Nick Stanger. Nick, where can they find you again? Go on our website, www.familyoffice.com. Check us out. We've got a lot of resources on there. We've got our own podcast, The Nick Stenger Show. It's on all the major platforms. And we try to do what you do, Trent, and give people some good advice and some good structure on where we think things are going. But thank you so much for having me. Yeah, appreciate it, Nick. And for everybody else, Winter Side Away Show every Friday, 1230 Eastern, 930 AM Pacific on LinkedIn Live, our Leadership to YouTube channel and Facebook Live. And then, of course, you can find our podcast on all the major networks. So check it out. Like us, subscribe us, share us. It's awesome. And until next Friday, we'll see you then on the Winners Find Away Show. Rebellious Infusions are organic flavored water enhancers. Rebellious provides clean, focused energy in liquid packets. Just tear the corner of the packet and pour 16 ounces of water. Rebellious Infusions have no sugar, no calories, and up to 300 milligrams of antioxidants and loads of L-thionine for brain health. Rethink your drink at drinkrebellious.com. For 10% off of your next purchase, use the code 99999. Do you want to be our next guest? Or do you have inspiring stories to share? Or do you love to inspire, support, and empower thought leaders? Feel free to send Trent a direct message on Instagram or Facebook at Leadershipity.